I'm building the e-bike of kayaks. So how do you control an electric kayak? With a phone app, with a remote control. I wanted the user interface to feel as natural as possible without removing you from the actual experience of kayaking. And this is what I came up with. A subtle on or waterproof solution that keeps the user fully engaged. This video will show you all of the OR electronics and firmware that go inside this housing, from an input button that doubles as the power switch to an LED ring indication. I'll break it all down. If you haven't seen my part one video where I actually make the electric kayak or my range testing video, you can check them out here. Natural as possible. <laughs> Let's uh, talk real quick about the 3D printed housing. My good friend, Jordan Godoy, he uh, designed this for me. It took a lot of iterations and we're still tweaking and testing things as we go. You can expect uh, another video coming soon that kind of breaks down the design process of this and the different testing that we've done. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. All right, before we talk about the electronics and the firmware, wanted to take a step back and just kind of break down what I need this thing to actually do. The final system will have two halves, the kayak half with the battery and the motor and everything, and the ore half. So the ore half just acts as the user input as well as collects all of the IMU data for the machine learning model. And the kayak half really won't change much from part one except for the addition of the Raspberry Pi, which will act as the brains talking to the ore half. I want the kayak to have two different modes, um, automatic and manual. Automatic mode is what I'm calling the e-bike functionality, which detects if the user's paddling or not. And manual mode will just be like the user can set a constant speed on the motor regardless of if they're paddling or not. Both modes will have a low, medium, and high speed setting that's controlled through the push button. I was surprised when I had a hard time getting the NRF24 working with the Raspberry Pi. After spending a frustrating afternoon getting familiar with this library and the chip, I have a few tips and tricks to share. After enabling the Raspberry Pi spy bus to talk with the library, I tried sending a test message of incrementing integers, but I would notice the first one or two messages getting through and the rest would just time out. The turning point for me was messing with the spy baud rate. Why is it always the baud rate? All the example code defaults the spy bus to 10 megahertz. Um, after lowering this to 4 megahertz, things started mostly working. When I powered up the IMU and LED ring at the same time, I would start getting a lot more dropped messages. So after a little bit of research, uh, I added a 100 microfarad capacitor to the voltage bus and this seemed to help stabilize most of my communications. The IMU is a BNO085 from Adafruit and it has a ton of features but I'm only choosing to log roll, pitch, yaw, raw acceleration, and raw gyroscope data. But it can also do step counts, shake detect, tap detect, and a few other modes. I chose to log this output to the Raspberry Pi at 20 Hz, and I think that'll be fast enough for my future machine learning models. At first, I was going to use the tap detect as the user input instead of a button, so the user would just tap on the 3D printed housing to control the speed set points and modes. The tap detect worked decently well when I tested it. And this would have been an interesting idea to try, but I think there's a few major limitations. One, it would be super frustrating to have this thing trigger anytime you bump the ore on anything. And two, I realized I have no power button for the system. If I had to have a button, I really only wanted one for power and input. So I started researching on how to have a single button control power and also act as an input. And I found some really interesting power management chips that can do just that 
while only drawing a few microamps of current. The first button press turns on the system, but any button press after that just registers as a normal user button press, and a long button press of 3 seconds or more will turn everything off. For the button inputs, I decided to have double clicks cycle through the two modes and single clicks cycle through the three different speed settings. This single power slash input button is actually turning out to be one of my favorite parts of the build so far, but this chip is seriously the size of a grain of rice and not easy to work with at all. So I'm going to design a little breakout board so I can reuse this more easily on future projects and uh, keep an eye out on my Tindy store if you're interested in that. I realized the user is kind of flying blind and I need some sort of feedback for them to know what mode and speed setting the kayak is in. So I picked up a NeoPixel RGB LED ring from Adafruit. This allowed me to get a little creative with all the different animations. So here's a breakdown of the following modes and corresponding animations. When you first turn the system on, it defaults into the connecting state. If no connection gets established within eight seconds, it'll trigger a fault. Once connected, the connected animation will flash green before moving on to the startup animation. The speed slash battery updates is the main display when the kayak is under normal operation. There are three speed settings, low, medium, and high. To switch modes, the user just double clicks the button, and when the mode change is triggered, the LED ring will quickly flash blue twice. I decided to use an RTOS on this project for the first time because I hate my love learning new things. In all seriousness, I wanted this project to expand my skills, and in the end I think the project benefited from it. I spent more time than I expected debugging my firmware, but eventually I got things running smoothly. Here's a breakdown of the architecture. I've got three input tasks, an RF receiver, an IMU reader, and a button reader task. The RF receiver pulls for new battery and fault messages from the Raspberry Pi. The IMU reader reads IMU data, and the button reader task debounces the input button and monitors for single or double clicks. Processing tasks. Two main processing tasks handle the logic for the OR firmware. They take in the button and RF input data to determine the commanded mode and speed, and they also determine which animations should be running. Output tasks. The output tasks consist of an RF transmitter and an LED driver task. The RF transmitter reports speed and mode to the Raspberry Pi for motor control. The LED driver reads a pixel map queue and drives the next animation sequence on the LED ring. As I mentioned, I had a lot of bugs and issues with my first run at the RTOS. Here are the major bugs that I had to squash. First, I had trouble with all the tasks running together. At first, I focused on general RAM usage and priority issues. I was allocating way too much RAM to each task and had my priorities inverted. I combined some tasks and some queues to remove redundant RAM usage, eating away at my 32 kilobytes of RAM. This helped, but I still had issues with laggy animation changes and running the RF receiver and transmitter together. By far the biggest issue I had with the implementation was how I was driving the LED ring. I was continuously looping through all 12 pixels and setting delays to create the animations. These delays were on the order of 50 milliseconds, and my LED driver task was trying to run at 25 milliseconds. So during each delay of my animation loop, the task would interrupt itself, and overflows would just build and build, causing massive delays when I went to switch animations. Rethinking how to drive the LEDs, I made my own simple version of a pixel ramp. I created a struct to hold a 2x2 array of 12 sets of 12 colors. 12 colors in one set makes up one frame for the LED ring. And each time the LED driver task is called, the 12 LEDs are updated to the next frame, or the next set. And this continues on a total of 12 times before repeating itself. My struct also contained a delay value, so each time the LED driver task is executed, it checks if this delay time has been met before moving to the next set of colors. 
The last issue I had to fight through was with the NRF24 transceivers. I noticed delays and crashes when I would try to run these two tasks together, and I realized it was a shared resource and implemented a simple mutex for accessing the radio. That seemed to solve my crashing issues. The last problem I discovered with the NRF24 is the timeout when trying to transmit to a radio that's not powered on. If no radio is on to receive a transmission, I found that the NRF24 takes about 30 milliseconds to finally give up on the message. When the other radio's on, all my tasks execute on time, but if not, there's a small visible delay in the animations. This firmware took longer than I thought, and I was hoping at this point to have the Raspberry Pi controlling the motor controller, but progress is progress. The next goals for this project are to fully test the 3D printed housing, shrink all the electronics to fit inside, and get the Raspberry Pi spinning the motor.